Uh, well, thank you very much for inviting me and thanks for coming. It's a beautiful, beautiful day in a fabulous building. Um, I teach uh, history of architecture for the University of Toledo. I'm not an architect. If I were, you'd be in big trouble. Uh, and I also teach uh, modern architecture, modern and contemporary. And I was on the search committee, the architectural search committee, for two of the architects who we'll be looking at uh, today. I was not on the architect selection committee for um, the Giza pyramids, however. I want to make that very, very clear at the very beginning here. So, of course, one of the things we have to, of course, salute, and I'd like everyone to give a, a big hand, of course, to the Libbies for really starting this whole ball rolling. So please stand for the Libbies. Thank you. Without them, of course, none of this uh, certainly would have happened. Uh, and, of course, they be, were major figures in giving land for and hiring an architect and helping to raise money for uh, the museum right across the street. And that's where we'll start uh, with, of course, the architect Edward Green of Buffalo, New York, who worked with Harry Wachter, whose house used to be right behind the museum and has been moved over a little few blocks in the uh, old West End here. And, of course, it started with essentially the front of the central block, which you see when you look across the street. Uh, a lot of the same uh, elements are there. You walk in today through a centralized door on a central axis. You walk across a couple of uh, big level places that are raised up with steps. Uh, one of the major features of the museum is you don't walk in exactly at ground level, but you gradually rise as you move from Monroe Street up to the, uh, the entrance. And this is something that's going to be very important, things we'll talk about just a bit later. Uh, what is interesting is the size of the library, and I'm not sure if I have a pointer, so I'll just point it out to you. They had four books back then in the library, so it's a very, very small library. That today is a, a small office. And it's changed, of course, over time. Uh, it was basically a T-shaped building with a hemicycle toward the back. And we're going to see how this will expand tremendously, of course, into a, approximately the building we have uh, now during the 1930s. Uh, here's a wonderful view. I love it because it's at an oblique angle. Probably many of you have seen this picture before. It's a very famous image uh, in 1912 of the building. And you'll notice, of course, there are no wings yet, but you can clearly see the steps rising up to that wonderful um, arcade at the center. It's in very much a neoclassical style, sometimes called a Beaux-Arts style, which was a very popular style in the late 19th and early 20th century, using classical elements uh, like columns, for example, and entablatures, the things which columns support uh, in Greek and Roman style, certainly. Uh, and I think one of the big influences, perhaps, on the architect is a building that my wife and I have recently visited, uh, the Great Altus Museum in Berlin, which was done in the early 19th century by Schinkel, one of the great architects and great intellectual figures of uh, classical Germany in the early 19th century. And although the scale is much larger with the Altus Museum, and there's actually a dome in that building hidden by that square thing on top with a flag, but it does have an ionic order which stands in front of a gallery, a kind of a space you can walk behind the columns, uh, but they, don't, uh, they have a very flat, what we call an entablature, the same way the museum does, not a big pediment or anything like that. So I'm, think, I'm thinking perhaps, I don't know this for sure, but the architect may have known uh, the Altus Museum because it's been a very, very uh, influential building. And so uh, a large lawn, also the director uh, house was, the director's house was located right next door. And we're going to very quickly move on into the period of the late 20s and 30s in which this uh, much smaller museum is going to be expanded tremendously uh, with the two wings and also end blocks, of course, of the, the museum. By 1931, uh, this is a wonderful photograph at the top, uh, shows that original central block and it's been expanded by two long wings that go out to another set of wonderful colonnades. The peristyle, of course, being behind the one on the left, which is uh, toward the downtown side. Uh, and then a wonderful collection of Asian art is uh, today behind a wonderful, wonderful collection put together by an absolutely amazing person um, behind the colonnade, which you see, of course, uh, on the right. Uh, at lower left is a photograph, a period photograph, probably done around 1935 or so, in which one of the great galleries that was uh, added also to the museum was a cloister gallery, which has an absolute genius who was in charge of that gallery. Um, <laughs> And on the right, it, what, what Carol and I found very interesting looking at these photographs the last few days is that's, of course, our classic <laughs> court. And notice how it's all skylights back in that period, all skylights. Today, we only have one at the center. Uh, the skylights gave a lot of uh, problems, of course, to the, to the museum over time. 
Uh, the skylights actually were not actually directly connected with the sky, but there were skylights over them, and very often water condensed in them and then would go down the walls and things like this. So it was reduced to a single skylight, and that was completely redone a number of years ago. I'd like you to notice also the span um, on the right there with the columns with the very, very long beams. If this were actually a Greek building or a Roman building and that were made of stone, those would collapse uh, because they couldn't possibly uh, go across that wide a span. Uh, they actually have steel uh, columns in them supporting them and steel beams running at the top. So it's kind of a cheater uh, form of classical architecture. But the great uh, grand central block, and then, of course, we have, looking at it, come back to that in a second, uh, there are two wings. Here's the central block, of course, and two wings, which then go out to, of course, the peristyle uh, and a series of galleries at the uh, western end of the museum, uh, which makes its very, very uh, particular uh, kind of profile we still have today, of course, for the museum. One of the wonderful things uh, that can be found in the archives of the museum are many, many, many photographs taken of construction. Uh, back on the, in the dedication of our building around 1990, the Center for the Visual Arts, we did a, a, a kind of a video show which was done all by hand. This was before computers really were used yet for visual things. But we made uh, slides of all of the pictures of construction of the museum and at the same time made slides of uh, all of the uh, pictures that were taken, the construction of University Hall, which took place around the same time. And we ran them on nine screens uh, when we dedicated the new building, uh, the Center for the Visual Arts. We ran all of these on two, uh, nine screens, which were stacked up. And we were trying to automate it so no mistakes would be made. But my friend Terry Fell, who was the actual technician, he was a musician, and he actually played this thing by hand with split-second timing. It worked absolutely perfectly. If it had not, I would have killed him. Uh, in any case, a wonderful image here. This is the educational side. This is the, the western side of the museum. There's the heart of the museum in the background already completed. And here, of course, you can see steel beams going up, something many people are not aware of. There's a lot of steel, of course, in the, uh, in the Toledo Museum of Art. This was done, uh, taken April 7, 1931. And the guy in the foreground is actually playing dice with some of his friends. <laughs> Also, we have wonderful photographs from the same series, and these are the beams going up, the huge trusses going up at left for the peristyle and at right, a further stage in construction uh, in which the roof of the peristyle is going in, and a lot of the ceiling of that, of course, is uh, suspended by wires from a series of, of trusses. So these are really marvelous things to, uh, to look at. This is actually a photograph I took the day I came to interview at the museum for my job. Uh, it was a long time ago. I'm retiring this year, and it's about time. And I remember, but I do remember uh, flying from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, getting on a plane on some, I think it's, I'm sure, an airline that does not exist anymore. Appalachian, Allegheny, Agony Airlines, we used to call Allegheny, yeah. And they were making fun of Toledo as we got on. I didn't like that very much. We flew into Toledo. I got airsick. I got off the plane. A friend of mine met me, a new friend. Uh, and he, they drove me by, a series of people drove me by this uh, just as twilight was setting in. And it blew me away. And I went, I want to work here, just looking at the outside. The next day I had my interview, got inside, saw the collection. I was so impressed. I really wanted to uh, work in Toledo and have done that. I did want a newer car, however. Uh, if I stayed. Here's a recent photograph, of course, uh, with a wonderful stage set, which was done about, I guess, about 20 years ago now, done by one of our students who was absolutely wonderful at carpentry and also faux painting. Uh, so one of the great, great spaces, certainly, in our, in our museum. Uh, the most embarrassing thing that has ever happened to me in that space was uh, I was asked to give a tour to an ambassadorial person from China who had come to visit Toledo, I think in terms of industrial connections, and was sent over for a tour of the museum. We stepped in from the classic court through the doors into the peristyle. The floors had just been waxed, but I didn't know it. And we all stepped onto wet wax and looked at each other and stepped back out, of course. <laughs> but it was kind of a sticky stepping back um, out of the peristyle. It was a very short tour of the peristyle. Now here's a wonderful photograph I also found in the archives, and see if you can tell what's going on in this photograph. Yeah, exactly so. 
Uh, this is the building of I-75, which is complete, where you see down toward the river, you see the two sets of lanes coming up toward the museum. And they're just beginning to take down, to raise many, many buildings where this red arrow is, uh, clearing the way for the expressway. To me, when the Frank Gehry building was open and met with horror by a lot of people, I always thought the building of the expressway was the most horrifying thing you could imagine uh, happening to almost any city. It happened to my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, and it just took out a whole section uh, of the city. But it was actually quite good for the museum because it cleared space behind it, which used to be a very direct uh, neighborhood. So here's another photograph, uh, just a detail. Uh, here's the very famous parking lot at lower left, you can see, which is, was right about where you're sitting right now. Uh, behind the museum, a lot of the buildings are coming down. Um, I think, didn't someone here grow up in this neighborhood, as I recall? You grew up pretty close to where the, the expressway went through. Yeah, because I remember you gave me a tour one day of your, your neighborhood. So this is uh, fairly recent, of course. This is in the uh, 1970s. And here's another wonderful photograph showing the, the wonderful two wings jutting forward east and west of the center block. And I'm emphasizing this because it has to do with another building that we're going to look at shortly. So by the mid-1980s, the campus looked like this. This is a great aerial photograph. There's no center for the visual arts. There's no glass pavilion. Um, it's essentially the museum, which now has a parking lot in the back, as you can see. Uh, and that wonderful set of ramps, essentially, or terraces, which come down to Monroe Street. And the two, of course, wings, uh, which jut forward uh, with also their own sets of columns. A very, very uh, extraordinary place. Quite beautiful. On this site, and you can see how the streets are completely different today. If the streets look the same to you today, you're driving illegally. Uh, the streets are all completely different here. Um, in any case, the street patterns all had to be changed when we decided to build um, the Center for the Visual Arts, which was a, uh, a really a union between the University of Toledo, which had had an art program for whom I worked um, at the uh, museum since 1921, and a decision was made whether there should be an actual department of art as part of the university and whether it should stay at the, at the museum. I certainly, and most faculty, certainly wanted to stay at the museum because of the great educational advantages. We also loved the, the collection and working with it and working with professionals at the museum. So a decision was made to certainly keep it, to form a department of art that was administratively connected to the university, uh, but now, of course, was going to remain here, but would need a new home. And that was because educational programs in the museum were also growing very, very quickly, and we were all kind of fighting for the same educational spaces on the ground floor of the museum. Um, I was with another person charged with determining where the building should go. So if you hate where it is, it's partly, it's 50% my fault. But I would like you to allow me to run out of here before the lecture is over uh, today. We chose that location there for a whole series of reasons, one of which was very important to the museum that if the museum wanted to increase gallery space um, in any direction around the back of the museum, it would be much better to do it at the opposite end, at the west end. Here, of course, was the peristyle, and it was unlikely that a gallery uh, would go in that space. And so uh, we uh, did a whole series of interviews with quite a number of architects. We actually looked at the work of 75 architects, I think. Bill Hutton was very, very uh, important to that discussion. I remember we were in between directors when we started looking for an architect. We didn't exactly know how to proceed. So Bill and I went down to Columbus, Indiana. And Bill was known for liking to stay at the most expensive motels possible. Anything that was, it had to be at least $19 a night to stay there. And so we pulled into Columbus, Indiana, very famous for its modern architecture and acquiring great architects to work in that town. And we stayed at a, a motel. It might have been a Howard Johnson's, or it used to be, I'm not sure. But it was about $19 a night. And we stepped in, stepped up to this, we signed in, and then Bill saw a postcard of the motel. He took it, put a stamp on it, and sent it back to the acting director and said, we've found our architect. <laughs> and so we almost had a motel here. It could have been a lot worse. <laughs> so we ended up um, looking at a lot of different architects, including Frank Gehry. And I remember uh, interviewing him when we were in Los Angeles, meeting him, looking at his buildings. I realized about halfway through the dinner with him that he was interviewing us, deciding if he wanted to work with us, not if we wanted to work with him. He had just won the Pritzker Prize, so he was in uh, very good shape. 
In any case, uh, he designed the Center for the Visual Arts, which was constructed between 89 uh, and 91, as you can see. Uh, and the building, I know a lot of people feel that it has no relationship to the museum. I had just had a, a whole group of modern architecture students in my class, and about two weeks ago, I took them around and proved to them, and I will try to show to you a little bit of how it definitely relates to the museum. And let's go back. Uh, here is Frank Gehry. That's actually um, one of his partners there, too, just to his left. No, he loves fish. He loves things that have to do with fish and scales and things like, like that. Very famous for his furniture as well. Uh, let me just say some of the things that we, um, we looked at. He had just completed the California Air and Space Museum, which is a building that has done okay. Uh, doesn't have a really great um, future after, oh, probably the 1990s. One of the buildings, a uh, set of buildings he designed, which was educational, was the Loyola Law School. And it was here that I absolutely fell in love with his, uh, his work. Uh, he worked together a whole series of buildings which had different functions, uh, administrative functions, uh, classroom functions, uh, public meeting. It's a Catholic uh, institution, so it had a chapel, which you see on the screen. Uh, Frank Gehry is Jewish, and he said he designed that so if you get at the right angle, you can see stars of David in the timber work of the <laughs> thing. Uh, in any case, uh, a whole series of buildings, and it was a very wonderful place to congregate, to meet, to talk, and we wanted something like that for our uh, our students to have a good place to meet. Uh, my favorite building which he did there is the um, building devoted to uh, classrooms and also uh, uh, faculty offices. And where I first really came to love his work was that staircase in which if you walk up it, you walk up through a yellow wall but are still outside. Uh, then you take a turn and you come up to the second floor by a cantilevered uh, staircase right here. You go up through here, uh, then you come back out if you care to take the stairs, uh, and they go back up and again go inside the building, inside of a glass box. And so one of the things that so many architects in the modern age have tried to do, as is so wonderfully done here, is to connect the inside and the outside, both in a physical or at least a visual sense. We call that continuous space, and it's wonderful here. You're practically outside, just looking to your left here. Uh, he did that very nicely with this, and it also made it into a very physical process of uh, exploring essentially what is a sculpture, which also is, is architecture. So I really love this uh, work. Uh, this is a place I would love to live. He designed the Schnabel House and gave us a tour of the Schnabel House, which is in Los Angeles, a beautiful area. Um, I, when I saw this uh, actual living room of the house, I told him it looked Romanesque. I'm a medievalist by training. You won't believe this, but Frank Gehry kissed me because he loves Romanesque <laughs> architecture. And it was right there, it was right around this stone here. And there's a marking here that says, Frank Gehry kissed Dick Putney right here. It's very, very famous. Uh, but a wonderful building, and here he was very um, famous for his use of experimental materials. And here he used the same kind of uh, folded metal, essentially shingles, you might say, for the covering the skin of the building. This is it at twilight. And here's the living room, and I, would, I was in here for about a half an hour, and I did not want to leave. It was absolutely uh, beautiful. This is the backyard. Not too bad. Usually I hear oohs and ahs. Mm, thank you. Do I hear any boos? Boo. That, by the way, the island on the right with the crazy roof, that's the bedroom. That's the master bedroom. <laughs> Uh, Carolyn and I went to the Vitra Design Museum in Germany, which is uh, very much related to Le Corbusier's Ronchamp Chapel, if you know that, a very beautiful uh, museum, which is dedicated, of course, to um, modern design, particularly in furniture. Vitra is a great uh, designer and manufacturer of uh, contemporary uh, furniture. And finally, he, of course, uh, these are some of the things we looked at and knew about. He, of course, designed the Center for the Visual Arts. And its relationship to the museum, I can show you yet again. I've already mentioned it. The museum has five major components. Uh, a wing here, a wing here, a center block, and then two kind of arms which <laughs> join those things together. So there's five separate parts. The museum, of course, was located originally on Monroe Street and still does, of course, face Monroe Street. But of course, it also faces the street behind it as well now, too. Uh, but Frank Gehry was faced with a building site that was going to gesture not only toward Monroe Street, but also had to now aim toward Collingwood a bit, because all of that property 
which is now, of course, parking lots, a big lawn, a partially a sculpture garden. Um, it also uh, was part of the landscape, which had completely changed uh, by the time he uh, designed for us. So his idea was to use a lot of the same elements in a very contemporary way of the museum. So what he did is he made uh, three major blocks. Here's the central one, like the museum. Uh, here is one which faces toward the west, out toward Monroe. And here's one which faces out, of course, toward the, the large lawn, which is now present. And uh, he makes them sort of like their wings, like the museum has, in which there's a connection here between the central one and this one. And there's a connection here between this one and the one which faces out toward the west. So it gestures in a kind of a... Uh, almost a 180 degree way opening out instead of just being a straight building. Uh, if it were like the museum, it wouldn't quite have worked so well. Uh, he also took some of the major um, design elements, certainly, which we associate with the museum and used them in the building. A lot of people don't realize that this, but there's a belt course which runs around the museum and it's exactly 13 feet high. And Gary didn't use it right by the museum, but this height here, this height here, this height, this height, these heights here are all 13 feet. So it's like a lower floor, like the museum, which is the mu museum's basement or ground floor. And then he rises up with two more floors, which are the same height approximately as the gallery floor of the museum. So it really does relate quite a bit. The museum also, today, it is very, very clean because it was cleaned on its centennial. Uh, when he was designing, it was very weathered. You might remember lots of green streaks coming down it. There's lots of gray in the marble. It's not a white building. It's a, it's a sort of a tan building, slightly tan building with gray in it. And of course, a very predominant uh, but low green roof at the top. And so these are elements which he included uh, in his design. There's the low green roof, of course, um, on the museum. And the museum also has a series of terraces from the level of the sidewalk on Monroe Street uh, going up to each one of the main blocks. And so he wanted to, in a sense, imitate that sculpturally by building a kind of ramp here which corresponded. It's the same height uh, as the stairs on the museum. So it's a very contemporary version with a different purpose, of course, for the, uh, for the CVA, which is very different purpose from the museum. We always see the museum as having a wonderful uh, in a relationship now, certainly with contemporary art, but it also protects the best of the past. And our building was meant to be a place where students would be uh, present, you know, essentially, excuse me, creating uh, the art of the present and hoping for the future as well. So two different buildings, very different in some ways, but very definitely he took into uh, shape the context. This was the first building, it was made of cardboard, and we decided it was too cheap and wouldn't stand up. <laughs> But actually, he does a presentation model for every one of his buildings. And we were lucky enough to borrow this for a while. I took some photographs of it. But there you can see the belt course in the museum, the back upper right. Uh, there's a belt course running around. That's the 13-foot height. And it just runs right around our building. But it's broken. It's not a continuous line. It's broken. So it gestures out like a, kind of like an open hand. <coughs> So, uh, also the colors, uh, he took that into account. There was a lot of gray in the marble. Look at the museum on a rainy day. It's very gray with big, big, powerful veins of uh, gray. And also the color green is certainly predominant as well. Uh, one of the criticisms of modern architecture was, uh, back in the 80s and 90s in particular, was that modern architecture weathers just like older buildings, but people pretend it doesn't. Uh, but all, all buildings weather to a degree. This one will weather a great deal too. And so he chose a material which is lead-coated copper which would weather uh, fairly quickly and pick up some of the patina which you see uh, in, the, in the museum. The opposite side, of course, he, he made a kind of a V-shaped building with a connection to the museum, which is a gallery. And by the way, uh, the messiest office in the history of the world is located right in that point. And that's my office. Uh, there are still people in there they've never found. <laughs> so anyway, a large courtyard was built. And here's a nice aerial shot. I think these photographs were taken using a drone, as, as I understand it, which is pretty interesting. They're also aiming for me in that drone. With two great staircases that look kind of like shutters that come out at different angles and, of course, uh, are in the middle of that uh, gravel uh, courtyard, which we have. 
The skylights on the top are approximately the same uh, height and approximately the same shape as the uh, skylights on top of the museum as well. It was a nightmare to build, as you can imagine. When they laid this out, of course, and it was actually fun to build, uh, they laid out the outlines. There were 65 sides to this building, <laughs> and they're marked by the orange line, which you see here. Uh, and I, was, I got to be really close friends with some of the people who built the building, and they were wonderful to work with. They came to, from despising it by looking at the drawings to absolutely loving it. They got totally engaged in the process of building it. They all became like little Frank Gehrys they would say, geez, on the drawings you can't tell, tell if we should do this or we should do this. So they would send out a telegram or something or a fax to Gary and said, should we do this or this? And they'd all take bets on what he would do. And pretty soon they were 90% right. They had all become little Frank Gary's, which was quite wonderful. Here is uh, opening day. Frank Gary is in the center course. David Stedman, our director uh, at that time, is on the very right of the screen. Um, really wonderful cast of characters here, really great people in the history of Toledo and the museum, certainly. Uh, and then they started the building, they stopped right here, and they decided they couldn't afford it. No, they kept going. Um, they, uh, you can see the big sort of auger at the right, which is uh, something which goes down about 60 feet to hard pan clay. And then as it comes out, they fill it with concrete, and those to those are attached all the vertical steel beams which came uh, next in the process. <coughs> Here are walls going up, concrete forms are in place. It was so much fun watching this, uh, this process. Then steel went up and the neighborhood got nervous, got really nervous. And then they started cutting a hole in the museum so we could actually get from the Center for the Visual Arts to the museum. And this is the day they did it. And they decided they were going to leave it just like that and let the students figure it out. No, they actually made a door, of course, which is there. Then the neighborhood became very frightened when black building, uh, building felt went on top of plywood, which was pretty frightening, but I love what this looked like one day, crawling all over this thing. Uh, you can see they had purple plywood, which is uh, fireproof on the outside, to which was uh, attached black building felt, which is like a water protector, and on top of that went metal, uh, which of course you can still see today, which is weathered. The, the purple was pretty scary when the whole building was covered with that. Here are guys uh, from Indiana, uh, very skilled people putting up the metal uh, skin on the building. Quite wonderful people. And here's the very last piece of glass going in on the building. So the building has predominantly a lot of green in it. The, the glass is all green and it picks up the green, um, which you see of course in the museum, in its roof and places where it is oxidized. Uh, and the gray picks up a lot of the colors in the gray in the marble. Uh, for those of you who are uh, students of the history of architecture, there's no question that he was inspired here uh, by the Bauhaus designed in the 1920s in Germany by Walter Gropius. And here's the front of the building. Fairly recently, we're looking into the, the library. There are 12 students asleep back there in the shadow. You can't quite see them. And I'm right behind them asleep as well. Uh, at the, at the front of this, people often commented on what exactly does this refer to, this ship-like thing in the very middle. And it certainly does refer to a ship. It's a ship-like form. Uh, and Luc Rabussier, who was one of the great inspirers of Frank Gehry, was someone who wrote a whole series of treatises about architecture, including references to boats and ships as things that could be examples to architecture. And if you look at Frank Gehry buildings from after about 1985, almost every one of them has some kind of a ship shape um, in them. And there, of course, you can see some of the colors of the museum. I just took that yesterday. Uh, but some of the green, which is very definitely picked up by the, uh, the Gehry building. Uh, so you can see some of the gray. This was cleaned back at the centennial. It'll probably get a lot grayer again. When it rains, you can really clearly see it. And finally, just this shot from the end of the building, uh, the closest thing to you is the former um, university bookstore that was located there, and then the glass fence. And you can see how the, uh, the slope of the roof matches the slope of the museum. Uh, the colors are very close. They harmonize uh, quite, quite nicely. So he did a wonderful job for us, I think. Inside the building is a dream. If you've never been in it, you can walk into it at any time. It's a public building. Walk around. It's really interesting. I suggest you go up the elevator to the third floor and walk around and then come down the stairs, and you'll get a real experience of some of the, the great spaces. Lots of great things to see there. Not my office, however. 
This is in the library. This is the ship part of the building, which uh, is cutting right through the roof over your head there and appears on the outside. There it is. I shave on that occasionally, at the very end of that. And here is another ship shape that's up at the very top of the building, which most people never see. It's hidden, so see if you can find it. It's fun to find. The orange thing is my, my thing. Uh, since our building, of course, he went on to a lot more buildings in which he used metal. I think our building is a very important turning point in his career and its design. Uh, he designed the Guggenheim in Bilbao, which was voted by a whole series of architects as the greatest building of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, he did the Disney Concert Hall. And after he had finished with us, I went out a lot to LA and would meet with him and actually go in and, and watch him uh, design. And I was in the studio one day with him and his associates, and they were designing this wall right here. And they spent about a week just on designing that wall, which was amazing. Uh, very, very interested in detail. And finally, uh, Carol and I went to Paris in December. And just opening in Paris is the new Fondation Louis Vuitton. Um, this is an aerial shot. I certainly did not take this from the plane as we left, but we got a beautiful, cold, cold, sunny day, and I took about 400 photographs. Carolyn took about 7,000, uh, but it's in the Bois de Boulogne. We saw it during the summer, and it was just uh, being completed, still with scaffolding on it. And it makes use of um, materials Frank Gehry never dreamed of at the beginning of his career, but they are sail-like shapes. He loves um, sailing ships and the shapes you see. Uh, and here they're made of glass um, surrounding a building. You can walk all over the top. The whole top of that building is like a terrace with staircases connecting the different parts. You can walk outside and get views to the Eiffel Tower and different parts of Paris. It's really an amazing place. Uh, something else, of course, that happened after Frank Gehry quite wonderfully was the, uh, the wonderful sculpture garden, which has been just a tremendous addition to our uh, museum. And of course, we owe that to the Wells, this wonderful space. Uh, Lori Olin designed it. He's going to, I think, design something more for the museum in the future. Uh, he's located in Philadelphia. He's one of the great landscape architects of the uh, contemporary world. Then something else went in. It was the last building I was going to talk about. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> it's across the street from the museum. It's kind of low and flat. Oh, yeah, the glass pavilion. Yes, and here's another recent aerial photograph um, showing, of course, some of the uh, solar panels, which are now in the parking lot of the museum. Um, and across the street, you can just see the top very flat roof. It's amazing of this building. This building is, as I recall, 15 feet high. Two feet of it are uh, a metal, uh, sort of what would you call it, a fascia it's called at the top. You can see it from right here if you look out in that curve. That's about two feet high, and you cannot believe what is behind that fascia, all the technology, uh, with lighting and heating and air conditioning and uh, all kinds of stuff. Absolutely amazing. And so the spot that was chosen for that required, of course, now this is going back to 85, but still all of this remained pretty much this way after the Gary building, and so it required some land acquisition. Uh, negotiating with, I think, something like 65 different agencies from the state and the city uh, to be able to build a new building here, a great site for it. And that uh, site was chosen, David Stebbin was the first person to think, I believe, of a glass pavilion. Roger Berkowitz and Carolyn and I and, and Rhoda Berkowitz, were, we happened to be in uh, the south of France looking at the Maison Carré, the great Roman temple which survives and a recent contemporary building, quite beautiful, had been built next to it. And we could see how the two worked together very well. And so the issue was, what kind of a building would you build here for what? The greatest, one of the three greatest glass collections in the world. It'll become the glass pavilion, and what, what kind of shape will it have? And that was one of the big problems, of course, in where will it go precisely, and how will the neighbors feel about it? Because we wanted to reach out into the, uh, the neighborhood. A lot of the neighbors were not happy with this idea at all. But I think it's come around pretty well because it's such a quiet, lovely building, so low um, and has a lot of features which I think enhance the neighborhood rather than subtract from it. The architects we selected were Seishima and Nishizawa uh, from Tokyo. Uh, I think they are, to me, she's a goddess, he's a god. I think they're absolutely amazing designers. Uh, we have met them, we have spent some time with them. We've been in their studio in Tokyo and they showed us a lot of their buildings. 
And we were very, very impressed with what they were uh, doing with their work. They're both equally incredible uh, designers. We uh, spent a lot of time driving around Hanshu, uh, looking at various buildings they had designed. And one of the most depressing areas was just outside. What's the big car manufacturing city in Japan? Anybody know? South, it's southern part of Honshu. In any case, it's a huge, sprawling city, very industrial. A lot of the car manufacturers are located there. And there, are, there is outside of the city block after block of apartment buildings, all of which are completely depressing. I mean, it really was. You go, you go through it for about 20 minutes. We came to one that, that she designed, which we, it was like uplifting your spirit. It was so beautifully done. And this is her uh, housing project for a place called Gifu which is very near the car manufacturing city, whose name I can't remember. It's very much based on a design by Le Corbusier, the great architect working in uh, the post-World War II era, who was designing housing for people who were displaced during the war. Uh, but her building is so very, very clean and simplified and elegant. Uh, I was ready to move in. I was ready to stay right there if Carolyn would come live with me. Hmm? What, you have, what, you're, what it is, it's a building, you can't see the whole thing except from the air. It's shaped like a zigzag. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, they are. So they're like, instead of having all the buildings enclosed, everybody can come out and sit outside. And people put tables out and things like that. Yeah, they're, they're placed so everybody has access to um, different kinds of porches. Corbu designed it the same way, but differently. It's really wonderful. Oh, it's yeah. wonderful, yeah, it's great. It's very clean underneath, very well lit. Corbu's buildings underneath were kind of depressing and kind of scary, uh, but these are really, really quite wonderful. In fact, let's move there. Should we move there? No. <laughs> no, it was, it's a very early project, and she has become, you know, one of the leading, one of, I think, the two leading uh, women architects who have been so excluded from architecture by tradition, but she and Zaha Hadid, to me, are the two best designers uh, period, let alone being women. They're, they're just absolutely amazing. Uh, we also wanted to see a lot of their buildings that would relate to us, particularly museums, and they were beginning to do museums. Museums are generally pretty cautious about architects. Uh, one of the places we went was out in the provinces in central Honshu in the mountains, and it's a very small museum there. They call it the N Museum. Each project has a letter in their shop. So this is, by their terms, the N Museum. And we wanted to see how they uh, designed a museum and also how they handled glass. And this building was cheap, beautifully designed, worked wonderfully for the art, uh, worked incredibly well with glass, and it made us all very excited about the possibility of using them uh, as architects. They eventually, of course, won the competition. A uh, very inexpensive <laughs> building. One of the things they did there which impressed me was it's in a very open sort of area, kind of a flat area in a plateau between the mountains. And the, one of the issues is getting art in and out, of course, of a building. And they designed it so that a truck could bring art and actually back right through the hallways and back right into the galleries. So the unloading didn't take place outside, then move through the rain or the snow, but you could unload directly in the galleries, which I thought was really uh, fabulous. And it's something which they've done here pretty well as well. They also designed with uh, a lot of the facade is made of glass, as you can see, uh, tinted a kind of a greenish color. And then the back wall, there's a hallway right here, which runs around the main gallery. And the wall right there is made of white plastic. And behind it are lights. And so the whole thing lights up. The lighting in the hallway isn't over your head. Uh, but it's actually the walls themselves, which cast a really beautiful light uh, on the hallways. Here's a shot of it at night. When I saw this picture, I went, ooh, <laughs> just love it. And it's a, it was a very inexpensive building, but really ingenious how they, they worked out a lot of problems and made it very beautiful. That's not exactly the museum porch, which you see coming forward from the door on the left. <laughs> Imagine big marble columns or something but really elegantly beautiful. This one blew me away. I could talk about this all day, so you're gonna to have to knock me over, kill me, and drag me out of here. 
uh, Seijima is from a family that had a castle, a kind of a small uh, Japanese castle uh, way in the center of Honshu. Uh, I think she's inherited a fair amount of wealth, I'm not sure. But in any case, she had a very hard time becoming an architect in Japan. But she decided to build a museum that would house the contents of the castle, but also preserve the castle. In this photograph, the castle is out of the picture uh, to the left. Um, and when you come up, you drive up, and this terrace appears, and you drive up over here. You come up, and the castle is here. And to the right, you suddenly see, as you get to the level of the terrace, this beautiful, slightly S-shaped building. You walk up to it, and right here is the ticket booth, right there. You buy a ticket, and I wish I could show you all of this. You walk underneath of this and then take a ramp which goes up. You can see the ramp right there. And beyond that ramp is just a forest of bamboo trees. It is absolutely beautiful. You get to the top of the ramp, you take a left through the door, and you look out through that window. It is so cool. And what I also loved here was that they used glass as a covering material as well as a window material. There's very few windows because it has galleries in it to protect objects. This is the only large transparent part. And they also handled the glass so it, it uh, kind of mimicked bamboo shapes, which is very beautiful. So it brings together high tech with nature, with uh, the past and the present, just absolutely wonderful. Very, very cool place. And then here, I always shop here at the Christian Dior uh, building. <laughs> Not too shabby. So they handle glass uh, quite beautifully. And so they got the commission. Um, and what was wonder about in, what, uh, wonderful about them, excuse me, is that I'm so excited I'm talking too fast. Um, I just, these are wonderful memories for me. Uh, when they <coughs> interviewed, they not only uh, were very sensitive to the location, thinking it almost certainly would be here. And by that point, I think it was settled it would be. But they gave us three or four, maybe five different ways to locate the buildings. Uh, one of them was a, a sort of a square shape like you're sitting in, but it was only one of five choices. The other architect who was the finalist gave us no choice, and it was like a way, am, uh, way too ambitious, loud building, which would not have gone with the neighborhood. We were very interested in the neighborhood having a nice, quiet uh, building. So here was the site right before construction began, after Sana was chosen. Uh, then they went into the grounds, so this is um, below your feet right here. Here is it a little later. It was a very frightening building as it was nearing construction completion because there were these horrible uh, sort of lean-tos around it which were really ugly and everybody thought that was the building. But what they were waiting for was to put the glass in last. And the glass, of course, lies in tracks, uh, which they had to, those pieces had to fit perfectly uh, in those tracks. And once it was uh, completed, the building became itself. This is an interior shot I took during construction. Wasn't too hopeful at that time. <laughs> Here's a corner. I thought it was this corner, but it's not. But there you can see one of the tracks where the glass had to fit, right there. And then this was later poured. And the floor you have here is beautiful. The Japanese architects love this floor. It was done by a local Toledo company. Wonder, I love this floor. Uh, polish and everything, it came up to the height of that, and this was a track for the, the glass. Um, this is the area here, which you see between the outer glass wall and the inner glass wall. And so finally it was finished. I think the name of it is the Toledo Museum of Art Glass Pavilion, as I recall. Uh, here it is, the sign was put up more recently than the building, of course. It's low, um, it is very quiet, uh, it can be extraordinarily beautiful at night when you see people working in here. Oh my gosh, just amazing. And very lovely during the day as well. The whole height is 15 feet. The, the glass is 13 feet tall and then it's a two foot area that has to contain all the lighting, all the technical stuff, water evacuation, all of that is in a two foot um, thick roof, we would call it, top to the building. This is a shot I took the day we were I think having an opening ceremony of some kind, and if you look at the grass, it looks very perfect. They had just rolled that grass out five minutes before <laughs> I took that picture. I said, come on, you guys, I gotta get a picture here. But very, very nice. Uh, the structure is very thin, and a lot, most of the structure is, you see those very thin white columns. They're just a few inches thick, they're made of steel. 
There's 30 some of those which do the major job of carrying the roof, which has big heavy beams in it uh, to make it very strong. This screen also hides uh, a solid, not a solid wall, but a series of trusses which are hidden behind it. And there's also over where some of the glass is done, there's some steel walls as well. But most of it's held aloft by these uh, very thin columns which you can see in the building. So it's very, very transparent. And in, in that sense, I think it's good for the neighborhood. Come over here sometime in October and come in that door. When all the color's out, it'll knock your socks off. But it also reflects. And so instead of denying the neighborhood, I love this back wall. It wonderfully reflects the neighborhood, and especially when the, the light is right. So you get two neighborhoods instead of no neighborhood. So it's very transparent, very reflective. I think that works perfectly for the the building and its whole concept and what it, uh, what it represents. One of the things I also love here that I thought Sage would do and they did is when we talked with people in the neighborhood, they said, um, we're really worried about trucks pulling in, there being a lot of movement of cargo, handling of things, a lot of noise. And so they made the entry to the museum for works of art and equipment on the side and most people never even notice it. It's right outside here and it's, it's masked with hedges. But that is right outside here where we're sitting. Uh, and it's right there, you can see it. But I brought uh, 30 students over here about a week ago to look at it and I said, have you ever seen the road that goes down into the museum? They said, no, there's no road that goes down into the glass pavilion. I said, come on over here. They were amazed that that is right there. But it's so nicely hidden, you don't, you don't really notice it. <laughs> My only problem was building that uh, brick skyscraper on top of the building. That, that bothered me a lot. I thought that wrecked the design. What do you guys think? I don't know. I don't know. One of the things they also designed was a beautiful trail, kind of like an English garden, which runs around. And of course, there's sculpture on the grounds, and I know that that will increase. The axis of the front door over there goes straight to the axis of the museum, but it takes a nice curve on this side of the street, this side of Monroe, um, uh, because they didn't want to destroy the trees that are out there. Would have, you would have had to take those trees down. And uh, so saving the trees was important. And then, of course, uh, it's not symmetrical inside, as our museum partly is, certainly. But uh, the main entrance uh, facing Monroe Street is here. We have the wonderful sculpture hanging right here. Uh, you take a turn, and then this sort of this L-shaped uh, uh, passageway. What do they call that? Anybody know? The, corridor. the glass corridor or something like that? Crystal corridor, that's it. Crystal corridor, wow. Um, so it separates, of course, the uh, actual making of glass, which is so unique about this building, making glass in a building in which you display glass, which is uh, very significant historically, is really amazing. And the rest, of course, includes some courtyards. One is right behind you with its curtains closed. It's this one. Right there. And then this one, of course, also, um, which I don't think it's used as much as it could be. Uh, in the summer it's used, yeah. In the winter, it's used a great deal for skiing and uh, pneumonia treatment, stuff like that. And here we are. Um, I'm standing right where that screen is, pretty close to it. You're all sitting right in the space to the right in the glass salon. What I love it, how it's open at the top, closed at the top. It plays variations with spaces. You have horizontal views, uh, vertical views. Somebody asked me today what this is. And this is a skylight for shops that are down below. So light comes in through this open courtyard roof, uh, it hits this and it, it filters into the spaces below. This is a, a beautiful shot by a professional photographer. This is the glass salon. There's the screen I'm touching right now. And uh, this, of course, is, what's it called again? The, it's the space between the outer glass and the inner glass. And it's used uh, to handle the cavity. Thank you. It's called the cavity. Uh, and it um, handles air so that the windows won't fog up. We were very worried about that, getting a lot of moistures and cold, moisture and cold, uh, so it would frost up a lot and you'd have a lot of problems, and that's why the cavity is there. So there are, there are very few true walls in the building in the sense of structural walls. They're quite visual. You look through them. Here's a great photograph by a professional photographer of this space. And if we watch long enough, we'll see ourselves slowly appear there. It'll probably be tonight. We'll see what happens. And here is a shot I took right here 
in the cavity. Uh, Joey, who does the, all the maintenance over here, he's a friend of mine, so he let me go in and mop the inside of the cavity. I wanted to see what it was like. It was claustrophobic as well. But Joey's very tall and very thin, so he's perfect for the, the cavity. Um, also, you can see some of the air. You can, if you look out here, there are, uh, there's air handling in the floor. There's also a few towers for it out there. There's a white tower right over there. That's for air handling for the corridor. And I think it's the last thing I want to show to you. Um, one of the most beautiful things to me when I watched the building being built and then when it was finished is just to look at the kind of drawing on the ceiling which are the tracks for the glass. They're very, very beautiful. They're places where different curving lines come together. Really, really beautiful. I just find that one on the right uh, particularly uh, beautiful. So take a look at that as well. And finally, I wanted to show you this because some of you may need this. This is called the bathroom. Uh, and you may be desperate. I'm getting there. Uh, but I thought this would be the best thing to show you at the end. Even the bathroom's really pretty cool, and it's got glass in it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.